Personalizing entails not only a region of ideas, but a confluence of, confluence of ideas, which means that we are in a process of creating something new. Many of us came together because we realized the importance of sustaining such methods of inquiry into our own respective research. As we all know, interdisciplinary studies provide interfaces, otherwise inaccessible within conventional disciplines <coughs> in the humanities, natural, and social sciences. This approach, therefore, is one of signal importance and potential for the shaping of our individual and collective discursive practices. We are gathered here today with such similar aspirations. Now this year's edition is the third in the series of seminars. There are among us we have lined up today several presentations and lectures in immensely instructive and has been an invaluable source of encouragement and support for our community of researchers. Lectures and presentations in the seminar shall explore a range of interests across literature, philosophy, politics and science thereby interpretively engaging with concerns ranging from questions of social and political identity to discursive shaping of history. This list of contributors is an absolute treat for us academicians who thrive on writing, critiquing and challenging cultural and intellectual narratives. We hope that it will be an enriching and humble experience for all of us here. And we more, than, more than that, we hope that everyone here enjoys the healthy discussions and dialogues that will follow after every presentation. And also, not the least, but we, all, we hope that all of us will enjoy the modest offering of Manipur cuisine that we are providing for you today at lunch. So, uh, let's begin. Uh, first of all, before we start with actual presentations, I would like to map out certain structure of how we are going to go about today. We have the special talk at the beginning of each session, will be, which will be given 20 minutes. So we will uh, put up a warning, uh, pre preemptive, sorry, sorry, preemptive warning signal five minutes before your presentation is about to get order. So please try to fit your talk within the time period. For the other presenters, we have fixed uh, 15 minutes for you. Again, the same format follows by five minutes will be given. You know, you will be given a signal five minutes before your talk is about to end. Okay, and uh, also we uh, have time for two questions after each talk, so we won't take more than two questions. Okay, now let's begin. First of all, um, yeah. okay. First of all, as the first talk of our event today, we invite um, Professor Bimola Koizam, and who will be speaking on the topic intellectuals and ground realities beyond the cliches. I'm not an early riser and I forced myself to come here and I knew that why frantically Rosen was calling me up. I get this feeling that you must be worried that I might end up around 10, 30 or 11. But I knew that not many people will also be there in the morning session. Uh, so I'm not the only one. So I'm not an oatman now to my own cultural reality. Okay, what I intend to do is that when Piggy asked me to give a title for the talk, you know, I thought that I must share with you certain major concerns uh, that each one of us must uh, be concerned about them in general. Uh, you can find yourself as I go on speaking about certain issues. And you know the title I have given is uh, Intellectuals and Ground Realities. It comes from some uh, concerns that I have for the last 12 years, particularly in the last 12, 12 to 15 years. I think natively I sensed the problem for more than 20, 25 years. But it was only during the last 10 to 12 years that it becomes very acute in me that what is the role of people who are educated in our society? What is our function? And it has become more and more um, uh, complicated as they go by and, and I had certain kind of personal experiences as well. And some of you must be knowing that I'm quite um, unconventional in the sense of uh, typical academic life. 
that I do not confine myself to teachings, again, going to a lot of public issues and so on and so forth. And this experience and the reaction of the people from my state is what has also allowed me to think. Uh, so, to position yourself, I, I would, I would uh, begin by certain concrete examples. People often say the academic normally uh, uh, talk theories and they sit on the ivory tower and if you become a physical scientist you have all the more nothing to do with what's happening in reality. You, all that you are interested is what's happening in the lab. Like PK sits in lab for a long, long time in the evening. I can and I know that Rosen once we were doing something together, he said, I'm gonna have to rush back. And after the film show that too. And just look at the wall, he said, look at me, and he was organizing the film festival together with me, and he had to rush back to his lab in the night in his lab. So I know so we are disconnected with reality, so to speak. And there is also a phrase which people often use in, from Manipur, you know, in, uh, ground reality. You don't know ground reality. What's happening in ground reality? Uh, so I was trying to understand what does ground reality mean when they uh, speak uh, like that. What does it mean? It's also another concern that I'll try to address. So broadly what I'll try to speak is um, the, this notion of the ground reality. And you can expand it to include what's happening in Manipur today. And what is the function of intellectual life? I use intellectuals, I'll go into that definition from various theories and experiences, from Lenin to, say, for example, Gramsci and others we can see. Uh, who's in the intellectuals, what is their role, and, and so on and so forth. So two examples I'll start so that you can feel more concretely. What would be the mind of a people who put out CCTV and uh, bought computers for computer education in Manipur and suddenly discovered that it wouldn't work because there is no electricity. It became a headline news in Manipur. What would the uh, other people in the rest of the world think? How did you plan, knowing very well that you don't have electricity, and then you still plan CCTV for security, beefing up the security, or you know, buying computers for computer education and so on. Will you plan it? Now you keep on talking, people talking about development, development, then look is policy. How many people must have talked over the years and about these policies? Tourism industry, health tourism, and all of that. But think for a while. If you do not have electricity or the, the kind of electricity that we have, which is hardly for two to three hours in 24 hours a day, and it has been going on for almost a decade now, how do you expect the hospital for the health tourism to run? How do you expect the hotels to run for the tourist industries, for tourism as an industry? What is the meaning of development if you are killing those small entrepreneurs or uh, medium-sized, you know, service or production units in the state. Without electricity from sawmill to rice mill to automobile workshops to photocopy shops, all sorts of things get affected. You cannot have a productive life without proper electricity. And yet, you know that ours is a society which has been talking about development, tourism, health, uh, tourism, and so on and so forth. And the latest one is what I have just shared with you. Then it's a headline in the newspaper saying the CCTV and in, did not work, or the computer has program has failed in the school because there is no electricity, though they have bought the computers. To my mind, any civilized or a well-organized society would understand that this is understandable. You cannot have CCTV or computer educations without electricity, and you do not have electricity for so long. How did you plan to begin with? Why is there in your planning you do not have these concerns of electricity first? And so many of us have traveled abroad and then, you know, in metropolitan cities and high flyers and you know, we, we are, it's almost like New York and London as you are familiar as the back uh, you know, of your hands. In spite of that, how is it none of us have ever thought or 
you know, uh, awkward to think about these, talk about tourism and development without one of the essential aspects of our life called electric power. And this is what I call it, the mind of our people. And it has something to do with not knowing. Now, if you speak this, what would be the probable reactions from home? You know, you talk a lot. You, you, you people talk a lot. You write. You don't know the ground reality. And the ground reality is what I've just suggested. It's one meaning of ground reality. The ground reality is that you plan tourism, you plan development, you plan computer education, you plan to give up security by putting up CCTV without the electricity. And that's the mind, that's the ground reality there. Now, how do we grapple with this ground reality? It's the first concern that I am sharing. So it's not going to be a, a, a talk on intellectuals and ground reality. And there is an intimate connection between these two. Now, what do you think, people like you and me, who are educated and some of you, I can call it, very privileged, uh, you know, the collapsing education system in Manipur, you know that there are schools and colleges where Similarly, you have more teachers than the students, and many of the schools have closed down. And then again, theory and Nobel Prize winner, you look at Amrita Sen's work or any developmental economists, they will say that health sector and basic education are the movers of economic development. It's a fundamental part of it. And now your schools and colleges have collapsed. Once the schools and colleges have collapsed, then Manipur University will not have its feeder. There is always a feeder institution. Why JNU thrives is because, because our feeders is all India. It, it is all India people who come here and educate. But in many of the state universities, it is the state colleges and the nearby places which fits the university. It's obviously from where you draw the students in Manipur University if your colleges and schools are not working properly. So overall decade, and then we are denying it. Any form of analytical work, informed way of engagement, you try to brush it aside by this remark called ground reality. That was the uh, one of the things that I have started off. But I realized that we must understand this expression ground reality a little more then this first reaction that I have is that you don't understand what you're talking about. I'm talking about your ground reality kind of position. And that's why I call the lecture as uh, beyond cliches, beyond the uh, mutual antagonistic positions. And this I position, this, this concern I position in a memorial lecture in Impal in 2006. That's the second aspect that I want to share. Uh, this is called uh, Arambam Somarendra Memorial Lecture. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the lecture is available online still. And surprisingly, they have so many of them now by now. Uh, 2006, 7, 8, 19, 11, 12. But I don't see the other lectures online still. And mine is the only one which is on online. There also, the central theme of that presentation was that the intellectuals, the academics must come forward for a new money. They have a huge role to play. I have analyzed it. Why politicians you cannot rely too much. By by this I don't mean you should reject politicians because no society can survive uh, without a political class. And you need to groom a, a mutual political culture and uh, and uh, you know the intellectual workers have a big role to play for that kind of thing. Uh, these are some of the concerns I put forward, but as usual, there was a huge reaction. You know, then when I position, for instance, saying that there is a massive silence in our state, that nobody is speaking out. There's a fear and, and suspicion. You know, this was way back in 2006. And then people say, who says that we are silent? And some people use it's a technical silence, war silence. And I also saw one scholar uh, analyzing the nature of silence, which uh, after the lecture, uh, you know, uh, uh, then I started wondering, am I speaking an Arabic language to a place where nobody understands Arabic? But you know, if you uh, trust me, you just check it. Because I'm saying it is in 2006. You read it carefully, it is online, and see the spirit 
the idea, the analysis, I don't mean that you should agree with that. But you should have enough ground to disagree with me in a rational manner, rather than brushing it aside with a cliché. And my job today is to lay out for us to move beyond the cliché. The first thing, it is equal for all of whether you are from physical sciences or natural sciences, you call it, or social sciences or humanities. We have a job at hand. And what is the nature of that job? And that should be the first way to look at ourselves as well. Now, I told you that this ground reality, that you don't know ground reality, has become a concern, and I can lay out certain kind of meanings before I go ahead with that. First accusation is that there's something real out there which your categories, your theories, your analysis is not addressing. There's a gap between the knowledge and the what is there in the reality. That's the first expression of ground reality. I'm trying to lay out certain meanings of what does ground reality mean. Okay. So the first position when somebody says that uh, it's ground reality, it would mean that what your theories and conceptual categories are speaking is not connected with, it's not about or oh, uh, uh, the reality out there. In, in the Newtonian physics, as you know, that you know, reality exists out there. Uh, and, and you maintain a, a particular accurate observation and precision of your description is what you long for. And uh, we know that how science has changed from that kind of position. I'll briefly touch on and in the later part. So first meaning of somebody telling you ground reality is that there is a gap between what you're saying and what's happening. So for us as a, uh, social science students, that would be concerned with, that means the theoretical categories and perspective do not address or speak of or about what is there out there. It's the first meaning of ground reality. Beyond this, we must also understand something. We, I'll try to address what is the gap and what kind of gaps are there that we must see. <clears throat> the second part of the ground reality is you must understand in, in an oppressive and very violent and murky situation, it is also an expression of fear. Okay, do not make me aware of things. It's a statement the person is making. It's not that what you're saying is wrong. What the person is saying is that do not make me see things which I don't want to see. If I see and understand, I will speak out and I will be targeted. Am I making sense? So one is a very deeply psychological kind of a meaning when somebody from Manipu says, you don't know ground reality. What he or she is trying to say is that, do not allow me to see or know the things which I am trying to deny, because once I get to know of it, I will get offended, and I will speak out, and I know that I can be targeted. That's the second meaning of ground reality uh, when somebody uses it. The third meaning is, whether I want to, I'm so uh, offended or not, and one is, the third meaning is, that I don't want to do anything. I know what's going on, okay, and I'm trying to earn some money, I'm, I'm an uh, entrepreneur by excellence in that given situation, and I want to earn something out of that. Or I'm thriving in this situation, I'm, I'm happy with what I am, I know what's going on. So, in the third meaning of ground reality, K is, is that it is an alibi for your inaction or, or your refusal to act and respond to the situation. This is the third meaning of ground reality. That I don't want to act, I don't want to respond to the situation and challenges. So it is an alibi for inaction, that you don't want to act. And the, uh, the fourth one is purely and clearly an excuse for lack of knowledge, paucity of understanding. In other words, what you are saying, I don't understand. That's why I call you theoretical. If I don't have what you are saying, it's theoretical. Try Brosen, for example, time has a beginning with the Big Bang. And some people, from the normal sense, will tell you, how can you tell me that? Before that, there was time also. Okay? So certain ideas of physics will not enter your mind because it is not part of our category. You cannot comprehend that particular world. 
Okay? That or say position and standing wall of time. And say that unlike Newton's absolute frame of reference, you say time depends on who's observing it. So you have a time, I have a time. So general sense will tell you what do you mean by that? You have a time and I have a time. So what I'm saying is the fourth kind of ground reality is the vocabulary and the way you speak about that world. The other persons do not understand and he doesn't have that ability or that particular required capacity to understand. So he says, yours is theoretical and yours is not connected with ground reality. I knew something. Something is intelligible to him, which is what he calls ground reality and what he doesn't understand is what he's saying theoretical. So broadly, we have the four meanings of ground reality when somebody uses it from money. That's what. There is a genuine saying that what you're saying and what is out there is a gap. Second is that do not make me aware of things which will make me offended and speak out and act, which exposes my life, so I don't want to be that. Third one is, is an excuse for inaction. You don't want to do anything. And the fourth one is that uh, it's a sheer lack of understanding or what, what can be called the paucity of theoretical knowledge or conceptual categories. In short, what you're speaking, you don't understand the language. So the best way is to say that I don't understand, tell me, is not the issue. The best one is to reject and hide my ignorance by saying that you are theoretical, you are not connected with ground reality. So these are the four sets of ground reality that people will talk in many people. But remember that. Let's see the examples that I've said, electricity and so many other problems, talking about development, about computer education, CCTV, health tourism, all imagining without electricity. Maybe Manipur would be the only place they successfully implemented, and the only place where uh, you know, solar-driven uh, energy system backs up the hotels, the hospitals, the automobile workshops, the Xerox machines to CCTV to computers, all driven by solar energy. But for that even, you need a plan, you need a scheme, how to do it. Now, this is the kind of situation. Now, given this talk of ground realities, in, 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 that's why I put that in plural. If you see in the title of my lecture, I said ground realities. So I've broadly spoken about four sets of ground reality, the meaning of the word ground reality when we use it in life. Now, let's address the first one. How far is it legitimate or not? And I can sense uh, by, through my experience, there are two ways of looking at this gap between the knowledge and categories, which will be true for both the sciences, social sciences and natural sciences. Let me address this first. <coughs> You know, we make sense of the world through certain categories and then, you know, these categories are again clubbed together in, in an abstracted ideational format called the theories. And that's how we work. So the first one to see is there a gap or not is to understand the nature of knowledge. The nature of knowledge, you know that, um, is driven by the imageries and success of physical sciences, the social science tried to mimic. You know what happened by Augusta Comte when he started the social sciences. You know, same kind of theoretical uh, technologies and conceptual categories you, we can use to understand the social and human world is what Augusta Comte taught. I mean, after having seen the spectacular success of physical sciences like physics and chemistry and so on and so forth. That's the beginning of social sciences. And strangely, Augusta Comte uh, actually try to uh, mimic so much that he has three laws of um, social action derived from Newton's three laws of motion. You know, Sarah metaphorically exactly re-rendering in a particular situation. You can see the so origin of social sciences was uh, 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 influenced by um, the success in the natural science. Now, the first way to address this gap between and the reality and the theoretical category, there are two enterprises for us to understand this gap. First one is hypothetical deductive method, which you must be aware of, which is used predominantly by physical sciences, but also social sciences uses it. What is hypothetical deductive method? You know I'm just trying to understand what is the nature of knowledge so that 
if there is a gap, how is it sought to be resolved is what we need to understand. In hypothetical deductive model, I'm just taking up one form of intellectual enterprise, a very prominent one, and then we will understand what does it mean by empirics and the you know, reality out there is not fitting into our theories. This is more true with social, uh, physical sciences. There are two forms of logics or reasoning, as you know, deductive and inductive reasoning. And this particular principle called hypothetical deductive method, which is used by physical sciences, combines both the form of reasoning. Okay, I'm briefly, I'll just, if you're not familiar with it, it's part of strangely, and it's, it's very bad in Indian universities, you know, one can uh, say uh, more or less conveniently that we are very bad with methodology. I'm teaching methodology right now also for the uh, for my center. Um, in my center, I teach this paper on the research method now. So, you know, I just finished evaluating around about 60 cases, and uh, I can understand that. So, I'll just give you a brief idea about what I meant by it. I'm trying to address the first part is the gap between the real and our theoretical enterprise or our science. <coughs> Uh, reasoning, you know, in deductive method, it means there is a general principle, then you derive from there. And also something all means are mortal, Rosen is a human being, a man, therefore Rosen is mortal. That kind of a reasoning is called uh, deductive reasoning. And if you see one person dies and you watch another person also dies, every person that you encounter dies, then you say, this is from each particular case, then you draw a conclusion saying that people die. Then this will be called inductive. So inductive is from the particular to the general and the uh, deductive is from the general to the particular. Now these two forms of reasoning is seemingly contrasting images. And science is supposed to be driven primarily by inductive reasoning. Now you have an experiment one, experiment two, experiment three only then you draw the conclusions and so on and so forth. But this particular methodology uh, technique or you know, a framework you can call it called hypothetical deductive method means from a general theory you derive a particular proposition, a hypothesis, and this will happen. If this is saying so and so, then it must also happen like this. Then let's check it. Then you have an experiment. If the experiment confirms, then the knowledge retains. If the experiment, that particular observation refuses, then you reject the idea. So it is, both the reasonings are combined in this hypothetical deductive method. Now, social sciences have also tried to do this kind of thing. You have empirical research, you go in the field and check and so on and so forth. So then you must also ask then, when people say that there is a gap between your knowledge and what's happening on the ground, there must be something wrong with the research knowledge. But people must know that social science is not out of the place. It's not from Mars or Venus. It is from the society and people do this kind of people talk to people and interview. There are so many techniques and, and strategies we have developed in order to crack through some of the issues. Okay? And then we have something called field work and uh, you know ways of doing those kinds of things. To know the reality much more clearly than uh, so if there is a gap, then it is our responsibility to see whether what are the gaps in our research. There is another kind of research which is uh, in social sciences, which we call it, uh, you know, grounded theory, which is rather than taking the concepts from your theory and then try to test it on the field, or whether the empirical data fits into these theoretical concepts and categories, the idea of grounded theory is that you go to the field talk to the people and through their way, uh, experiences and uh, you abstract the concepts and the theories. And this is majorly followed in what you call it qualitative research method. It will have a fit between people's experience. In other words, you derive those categories from the field work when you talk to the people and there are lots of ways in which field works can be carried out. Participant observation, these are some of the classical terms, you know, you take part, part, take in the society's level and so on. So these are the forms of knowledge, so one must not simply brush aside any form of intellectual intervention as, you know, you are lacking ground reality because a good social scientist, a good knowledge worker, 
they are bound to have some connections with the reality out there. If the rule is <coughs> there is a gap, then the knowledge is invalid. And therefore, by definition, knowledge enterprise of the academic world is to relate with the world. It cannot be not with the, without the world. It cannot work in that way. So this first thing, if there is an accusation in the first meaning of a ground reality, then we have to check both ways, whether their argument is valid or not. If somebody says that without electricity, you will not have a development of, of this kind, how can you imagine if somebody says you don't know the ground reality, then I would suggest that this person doesn't understand that what I'm saying is connected with what's happening. In fact, the way I have given you four sets of ground reality today, it's byproduct of an intellectual world. You will not just get it, you just get confused why this world is coming in. Today I share with you four types of ground reality when people use this world back home. What does it mean? The second part, how much time I have? Five minutes. Okay, now I have to rush. Um, this is a long topic. Uh, the second part uh, is, is that I'll just briefly, well, as I told you that social scientists or academics in universities do not come from outer space. They are part of the society. So there are various ways in which their understanding of the social world uh, is also socially uh, situated in that sense. In other words, your social being is not independent of what you know of, of the world. If you are a woman, you have a particular way of looking at things. If you are an upper caste uh, or a particular class, you know, this kind of subject position has something to do with what we know of the world. So the fact that we are located in JNU or Delhi University will have a particular way uh, of, of seeing things than perhaps a people in Manipur University would see. These are called subject positions. So we need to understand. This has been talked about in social sciences as the reflexive position, and you must understand this kind of things. Now this in the second part, I would like to talk about intellectuals a little brief on this front. Do not assume that, as most of the people tend to assume, that what we know of the world is independent of my ideological position, my gender positions, my academic position, and so on and so forth. It is often said that, you know, this is mimicking from uh, natural sciences. We tend to have a vision from nowhere. Visions are always from somewhere. I see this room from this position. This observer's position even was recognized in physics. For example, uh, Heisenberg has this famous quotation when he says, we must remember that it is not nature itself that exposes to us, but it is the nature as exposed to us through our method of questioning. It is our question which makes the reality comes to me in this particular manner. It's a famous word from Heisenberg. Or worse, I mean, he has said so many things which is done, uh, is grows in your field uh, in, in physics. Also, uh, um, this is from your work. I used to read a lot about his literature. Uh, this, is, this is important for us to learn methodology. For example, Heisenberg's uh, saying that particle is only an idea embedded in the theoretical formalism of the physicists. <coughs> you know, these two statements that I've shared with you problematizes the so-called dichotomy between the observed and the observer. The, the scientific knowledge and observer. This is a big time theory, but in social sciences it is much more sharper this problem is. Now, so an intellectual, who is an intellectual then? And briefly, because I don't have time, so I'll cut short. Who is intellectual? Even if I take two, three minutes, it's okay because I'll just share this part. Who is an intellectual? General definitions, the one who does mental work. And that's the first definition that we must understand generally. And uh, Antonio Gramsci says that all men, and, and some feminists will say within bracket, perhaps all women as well, are intellectuals. Insofar as we do mental work. This is Gramsci's work. He doesn't mention that women part though, as usual. As the all men are uh, intellectuals. Why he said that is because intellectuals are the one who does mental work. You think, the moment we stop thinking, then obviously we will not become homo sapiens. You know, homo sapiens definition is what? A man who thinks, the homo who thinks is homo sapiens. Okay? Uh, so what happened is, uh, but he says, but the intellect all, they, they are not, they do not perform the social function. 
In other words, this is the distinction. Intellectuals who, who does mental work, but they do not have a social functions uh, in that sense. You know, for example, when I am teaching you and I am talking to students, I am performing a social function. If I am a revolutionary ideologue, then I am working my mind and I am performing a social function. In a simple way, that's the difference. So all men are intellectuals, but all of them do not have a social function. What we call intellectuals, in general sense, therefore, is the one who performs a social function via mental work or by virtue of their mental work. In that sense, all intellectuals will include scientists and social theorists and thinkers, all of that by definitions, but it is not so again. By and large, when you refer to someone as intellectuals, it is the poet, the theorist, and contemporary social scientists. These are more likely to be used with these people than the uh, people from physical sciences or engineers. But by no means, it is absolute though. There are people who are also considered intellectuals from the uh, natural sciences, especially when you go into bioethics, uh, you know, biotechnology and others, because there are certain ethicals that you have to take a position on cloning, for example, your views become important and, you know, so you debate it. The second meaning of uh, generally from there in the, is, the first is, intellectual is the one who does mental function, but by virtue of that you perform a uh, social function is what you can broadly call intellectuals. <clears throat> when there is a modern terms, and remember that these terms originated in different contexts of, uh, in historical moments, from in Poland, in Russia, in UK and United States. Particularly these are the broad areas where major theories of who is an intellectual appear in that sense, huh? in, in Marxist traditions and how it appeared, this particular notion of intellectuals and so on and so forth. Um, these are to position them in a particular historical context. These terminologies, I'm only sharing with the general meaning of that, what we can be. But there are other nuances of that. You must know that every term originated in certain moments in history, in certain particular contexts. Uh, the other one is uh, intellectuals. There's a very popular term now called public intellectuals. And there are a lot, lot of debates have been going on on who is a public intellectual. But broadly, again, there are certain features, which common features which people talk about when they talk but who's an intellectual? Normally an intellectual is not confined to uh, uh, academic life. Even if you are a university professor, by that definition then you do not, not be called uh, intellectuals. It is, an, it is a professor or a teacher or a lecturer. But intellectual is normally the one who are, you will see, invariably very prominent in the public debates. Who comments on what's happening in societies and so on and so forth. But this is one feature that what people normally term as Intellectual. That's why it is not confined to the academics only. You have artists and you know thinkers, filmmakers will also be called intellectuals in that sense. A second feature that uh, some people will often talk about intellectual is that they do not confine to a particular discipline. They cut across wide range of discipline and tend to speak in a range. So, for example, Amrita Sen will teach philosophy, social theory, and in economics. Okay or Patho Chatterjee's in India. He teaches in US anthropology, he's a historian, he's a political scientist, if you term in that. So they, their intellectual concerns are wide ranging and they have something to do with what's happening on out there more, more prominently. Noam Chomsky, a very well-known public intellectual contemporary. You see there how he was so vociferous about East Timor's independence and Iraq war and so on, so, but he's a linguist, a social theorist, and so on. So the one character of intellectuals are those who move beyond the academic world and addresses larger issues <coughs> and concerns across discipline. Now this is the nature of intellectuals and you know this is what we need to ask is do we do we do we have this kind of intellectual in our society who who, who influences the processes. The last part which I want to <coughs> handle is as I said it at the beginning, that intellectuals are from the society, they have a particular vantage point. And this has been debated in terms of whether the intellectuals <coughs> have a class of their own. I would like to share this part, very important in Manipur, because one of the gentlemen that once asked me, who was a college teacher and became an official later on, 
uh, a senior guy, he asked me, Vimal, tell me, is there intellectual in Manipur? I didn't have an answer. <coughs> if you think the example I started about electricity and the people planning things and doing something else is a lack of a mind, is also, I think, directly related to this question of, do we have an intellectual? Now, this particular last part which I'm sharing is whether they have a class of their own or not. What is the class interest of these intellectual? Marxists, they do not form a class of their own in the original formulation of Lenin. Okay? And they are a stratum as, as he would refer. You know, it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's, it's that particular line between the exploiter and the toilers, between the bourgeois and the proletariat. You know, this intellectual is, is a stratum according to him. And neo-Marxists like uh, uh, Gramsci uh, would talk about as having that every class have their own intellectuals. That means married to their own class structures. And what he says is often is that there are, he, he talks about often two kinds of intellectuals, you know, organic intellectuals and the um, uh, traditional intellectuals. And the job is to turn all the traditional intellectuals who are like university professors and others to an organic intellectual that is married to a concerns of a particular class. And as a revolutionary <coughs> practice that he says, we do it. I'll end by a few comments on here. In Manipur, the class structure is, remember that, this is, uh, I don't have time, that's why, otherwise I intended to explore on this further. So, by the way, it's a part of a work that I'm doing right now for a book. In Manipur, our class, this all this category of middle class and, you know, this <coughs> bourgeois and proletariat may not fit in very well. It is, a, it, our society is in fruit, <coughs> it is in a flux, so the nature of the class, class and middle class and all these things have to be empirically confronted and historically situated vis-a-vis uh, -vis our experience in the neighborhood. But one general frame, the class interests of Manipur. You know that in 20th century how this began. Much of them, as they call it, there's another term called intelligentsia, the educated professionals, okay, which is also considered uh, sometimes interchangeably with intellectual, though intellectual is, is, is a kind of a subset of a larger uh, term called intelligentsia. But in many of the writings, these two terms, I find, found them uh, used interchangeably in, in, in many of the texts. Uh, is are rooted into the transforming political economy of the state. The emergence of the modern state, modern taxation system that the British introduced after the 1891 war. And you can see that all our cultural and social political awakening is linked to that intelligentsia, educated. First generations blossom around 1920s, the literary magazine called Vete Chenu appeared. <coughs> then you have this theater and others in the 1920s, and it turns political in the 30s. Then the second generation who are born in the 30s and 40s become culturally, they blossom in the 1950s and 60s. The song that we are familiar with, uh, this in you know, Sanale Park, Manipur, and all of these things are byproduct of that, and politically became very active by that time. So you know that there is emergence of this class of educated professionals, educated lot, <coughs> has something to do with the transforming nature of the state and its political economy. Today, this is the last part. We are driven by twofold processes, according to me. The general framework is the donor-driven economy. 90% of our economy is funded, the centers run there. And most of them are seeking employment of the state. So in the uh, question of what is their class interest and their, what is their views, and they will not be that critical as because this particular political economy, that you need to be a worker, you need to get jobs, and so on and so forth, so it's a state driven and it is largely funded from outside. That's why there is a subservient, I sometimes call it in Maitail on it's much more effective. I call it Minai Naithang's culture. And a lot of our cultural backbiting and backstabbing and personalized argument rather than talking about the frame is because a Minai will never respect another Minai. Okay? And then you will be envious of a Minai who seems to live like the masters. So you know, there's a daily and you know, is this and this personal things is born out of that particular political economy because it's driven by state and it is funded from outside. And you will not have a sharp critical engagement with that kind of a position. This is what I'm trying to suggest. 
you the question of whether the intellectuals have a class position or and what kind of ideological orientation they will have, and we need to understand what is the class structures. Much of our intelligentsia, of which what you can call intellectuals, are all driven by this political economy. Funding as you see, whether it is in the arts, culture, academia, most of us are dictated by this political economy, and therefore their visions and viewpoints is not that sharp. And this lack of an intellectual sharpness in criticism aggravates the decadence that I have started off in the lecture, the kind of situation. Now, this is where we must understand how do and why, first of all, why Manipur is in the state of affairs as it is, what is the role of intellectuals, and what we can do. As some of you in the university, my theory is that even though it is still linked with this political economy, <coughs> university system, is a site where direct state intervention is mediated, not unlike other forms. And this was what I have positioned in 2006. And they must take the lead. And as we have examples, you know, Yonvo Saad, he says we need to speak up. This is a conscience keeper. In, in fact, I use this word in that lecture. And that there must be some people who takes the role of the moral conscience keeper of the society against all odds, against all threats, you speak out. Interesting part is that if you try to do it, it is your own society which is still trying to pin you down. Personality and character assassination will be there. But you must understand, this is not personal. This criticism against this kind of work is a byproduct of a historically situated political culture driven by a particular political economy. If you understand this, you cool down and then you work and pursue your goal. Otherwise, you will try to distract yourself in that. And this is what I will consider as a true critical role that intellectuals can play. <coughs> the one, generally, each one of us who play work through our mind and then do something for this society. If you get alienated from there, then the society is going to end and perhaps you will also end. And that's the last part of all of our generation who are born, youngsters in the 1980s, late 80s. They are going to be driven by a particular neoliberal economy and their metropolitan exposures. Culture is bound to change, just as in China. Their technocrats were trained in Eastern Europe, and now most of them in their 40s who are trained in the Western countries. There's a slow cultural shift in China. In a similar way, Manipur will also change between a schism between those people who are trained in Manipur and those who are exposed to the metropolitan cultures and their interests. So this is a possible trajectory. And even this, to grapple with it, you need a critical intellectual engagement and give a roadmap for what Manipur is and what Manipur can be <coughs> in the future. Thank you.